Welcome to St. Simon's Parish. Today, the Church celebrates the baptism of the Lord. Through our own baptisms, we are members of Christ's body, and God says to each one of us, You are my beloved son or daughter, my favour rests on you. Today, let us listen for God's assurance that we are loved and that we may have life and joy in God. Please stand to welcome our celebrant, Father Kevin, as we sing our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. Well, welcome to you all as we come together for our Mass today. It's the feast of the baptism of our Lord, which is a sign that things are getting back to, dare we use that word, normal, in some ways or other, a little bit abnormal in many other ways that we would never have anticipated this time last year. But in terms of people beginning to return from holidays to a degree, beginning to get back to work, whether it's from home or in the workplace or whatever, and from a church perspective, we've concluded the Christmas season and we'll get back to that rather quaint phrase of ordinary time. And over the past year, of course, Life has been very ordinary in many different ways, but we especially are aware of the challenges for people, particularly in other parts of the world. It's difficult enough in our own territory with borders and so on and people stranded and the other things that we are very much aware of. But go over to England and that's another story altogether, of course, and very concerning indeed. And for many of you who would perhaps be watching this with relatives in Europe and so on, Certainly a difficult time for us all. Let's hope that 2021 brings some relief on many levels. We welcome especially, of course, our 
extended family on 89.9 The Light, always an important part of this Mass each weekend. And, of course, quite a strong number of people still being part of our parish at St Simon's, our virtual parish through our YouTube channel. And in addition to that, of course, the people who are in increasing numbers able to gather in person in our churches, and let's hope that that continues to maintain itself. Let's just pause for a moment now at the beginning of our Mass and we'll ask God's forgiveness for our sins. Lord Jesus, you are the beloved Son of the Father, begotten by God. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Lord Jesus, you baptise us with the Holy Spirit. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you teach us how to love one another. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, when Christ had been baptised in the River Jordan and the Holy Spirit descended upon him, you solemnly declared him to be your beloved Son. Grant that we, your children, born by adoption and reborn of water and the Holy Spirit, may always be well-pleasing to you. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. In the first reading, the prophet Isaiah calls all people of Israel to repent and turn back to God, who is rich in mercy and forgiveness, and their blessings will be abundant. The first reading is from the prophet Isaiah. O oh, come to the water, all you who are thirsty. Though you have no money, come. Buy corn without money and eat, and at no cost, wine and milk. Why spend money on what is not bread, your wages on what fails to satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and you will have good things to eat and rich food to enjoy. Pay attention, come to me, listen, and your soul will live. With you, I'll make an everlasting covenant out of the favours promised to David. See, I have made of you a witness to the peoples, a leader and a master of the nations. See, you will summon a nation you never knew, those unknown will come hurrying to you for the sake of the Lord your God, of the Holy One of Israel, who will glorify you. Seek the Lord while he is still to be found. Call to him while he is still near. Let the wicked man abandon his way, the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn back to the Lord who will take pity on him, to our God who is rich in forgiving, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways not your ways. It is the Lord who speaks. Yes, the heavens are as high above earth as my ways are above your ways, my thoughts above your thoughts. Yes, as the rain and the snow come down from the heavens and do not return without watering the earth, making it yield and giving growth to provide seed for the sower and bread for the eating, so the word that goes from my mouth does not return to me empty without carrying out my will and succeeding in what it was sent to do. 
And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The response, you will draw water joyfully from the springs of salvation. You will draw water joyfully from the springs of salvation. Truly, God is my salvation. I trust, I shall not fear. For the Lord is my strength, my song. He became my saviour. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. You will draw water joyfully from the springs of salvation. Give thanks to the Lord. Give praise to his name. Make his mighty deeds known to the peoples. Declare the greatness of his name. You will draw water joyfully from the springs of salvation. Sing a psalm to the Lord, for he has done glorious deeds. Make them known to all the earth. People of Zion, sing and shout for joy, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. You will draw water joyfully from the springs of salvation. In the second reading, St John emphasises that we are born of God when we put our trust in Jesus and his saving work in our lives. A reading from the first letter of St John. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ has been begotten by God. And whoever loves the Father that begot him loves the children whom he begets. We can be sure that we love God's children if we love God himself and do what he has commanded us. This is what loving God is, keeping his commandments. And his commandments are not difficult because anyone who has been begotten by God has already overcome the world. This is the victory over the world, our faith. Who can overcome the world? Only the man who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who came by water and blood, not with water only, but with water and blood. With the Spirit as another witness, since the Spirit is the truth, so that there are three witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three of them agree. We accept the testimony of human witnesses, but God's testimony is much greater. And this is God's testimony given as evidence for his son. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand to welcome the gospel with the acclamation. Alleluia, alleluia. John saw Jesus approaching him and said, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. In the course of his preaching, John the Baptist said, Someone is following me someone who is more powerful than I am, and I am not fit to kneel down and undo the strap of his sandals. I have baptised you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. It was at this time that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised in the Jordan by John. No sooner had he come up out of the water than he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit, like a dove, descending on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved. My favour rests on you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. There's something happening probably really all over the world, irrespective of COVID restrictions, maybe a little bit limited like so many other things at the moment, but it's still happening because it's early January. And certainly in this part of the world where our sort of scholastic year, school year, runs along the calendar year as well. And that is that there are a lot of young people, some may be still at school, but they're entering into maybe year 11 or 12, or maybe they've left school and they've gone to university or some institute 
And what's in common, of course, they're starting a new job. Maybe starting their first job. Might be part-time at Macca's or whatever. It might be starting a trade. It might be having done some university studies and so on, that they've been able to secure some employment, hoping that what they've studied for is what's going to be their life's work, but aware that often that's not the way it works out. But I think of that at this time because today's feast of the baptism of our Lord, it's not just about baptism or our baptism. It's because it's an emergence of Jesus into a different kind of workforce. He already had a job, of course, he was a carpenter. And one might presume it was probably a pretty good one. So it's not exactly his entry into the workforce that's recognised in the baptism feast that we celebrate today. But it is nonetheless the beginning of this public ministry into which he operated. And it's maybe something as so many people around us, and most of us will know young people who are emerging into their first work, to acknowledge what an extraordinary experience that can be. And indeed, it can be quite a life-changing thing. It certainly was for Jesus. One thing to be a carpenter in a small village, another thing to be the saviour, a wandering preacher, a miracle worker, toast to the town one day and hounded out of another town the next. You know, all of the extraordinary experiences that happened to Jesus in those three years following the event that we commemorate today of his baptism by John the Baptist in the Jordan. But it prompts us to think about the importance of work and especially being part of a workforce in our own life. It's something which, well, for some of us, it goes back a long way. And maybe the impact is dimmed a bit, which is a pity because those early days in the workforce, very much a formative part of who we are. And they're a way in which God, in his wisdom, looks upon us in a way in which he looked down on Jesus emerging from the waters of his baptism and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased and commissioned others to listen to him. So maybe today we might just think back on that and I was reflecting and it's not meant to be about me, but I'll tell you a little bit about my early jobs because they were very formative. And as I do my little piece of reflection, maybe you can do yours on what you did. My first job was when I was still at school and I went to work at the menswear department of Buckley and Nunn in Burke Street, now known as David Jones, doing it pretty hard in the retail issue at the moment, I suppose, a few more David Jones stores not doing all that well like many other stores. But in those days it was certainly thriving, not because I was there. I was only in my last three years of high school, secondary school at the time, and it was my first venturing into having to get up and be at a certain place, having to dress appropriately, having to look at the hierarchy, if you might look at that, of the workplace, but most of all, the acknowledgement of people who were coming in, looking for this and looking for that. My most memorable sale was to sell a pair of men's braces to Mrs. Bolte, who was the wife of the then Premier, the later on Sir Henry Bolte. That's the things that you remember. But uh, she was a very gracious lady, as I recall. I hope the braces fitted Henry all right. But anyhow, was uh, one of the things we, we were told by the people in charge of the department was an often heard phrase, the customer is always right. Well, we found that the customer was usually right, but when you're a kid of 15 working and you're the sort of lowest rank of the hierarchy, you know that the customer was always right. But it was a thing of respect for the general public within the context of the work that had to be done. And accepting the fact that when you're starting off, you've got to be prepared to 
sweep the floor and put stuff away and put up with people who are unreasonable and all the rest of it. Good training for someone who's to become a priest, I can tell you. <laughs> so that was the first job, five pounds, four and six. I got paid for that. And then I went on to the seminary and we had three months holiday in the seminary which were not spent basking on beaches at Port Sea or Sorrento. They were mainly used to be in the workforce. And in many ways, no disrespect to the Jesuit priests who taught me in the seminary, but in many ways I think I learnt more in that workforce about life and about, to a degree, about priesthood than even while I was in the seminary itself because this is the field in which I was supposed to work. And in my first four years outside the seminary, I worked for two months at a time at a place called the Victorian Titles Office. And I was in the public service and uh, I learned a lot of things there too. One was that the fact that many jobs, maybe most jobs, can be pretty boring. But if you want to have a paycheck at the end of it, you've just got to do it. And this was a matter of filling out pieces of paper which somebody else would type up well before computers came along. But there were always different lights at the end of the tunnel and different interesting people that we would meet, particularly in the workforce itself and fellow workers. I shared a desk with a fellow called Ian Meldrum, who is now known far and wide as Molly Meldrum. And he was a law student at the time, and I vividly remember we were filling out these forms that had to be put onto titles, and we would draft what had to be put there, and he passed these papers over to me. He said, have a look at this. And it was a fellow called John Christmas, was the fellow's name, and he was marrying a lady called, shall we say, Joan Harrison, I'm just making that up. But he said, look at this, he said, they're getting married, they're buying a block of land together, a house together, but look at the name Christmas. I've never seen that before. He said, can you imagine if, in fact, his fiancée, her name instead of being Joan, it was Mary. When they got married, she'd become Mary Christmas. And he said, if they're one of your mob and they're Catholics and they had a son and he went on to be a priest, he'd be Father Christmas. So <laughs> he was quite a character in those days, the old Molly and still is, of course, but that's tr absolutely true story. So that was the title's office, or the TO, as we called it. And then I went to something a bit more dramatic, and I went to work as an orderly at St Vincent's Hospital. And that could be quite dramatic, particularly in the, in the emergency area, where you never knew what was going to happen. But it's there, maybe, that I found this was the sliding entree into my ministry as a priest of people who were vulnerable, people who were scared, people who were relying on me, for goodness sake, to talk to and maybe in particularly in casualty or emergency as it's called now, in the small hours of the night because there's no one else to talk to and it was almost like my preview of listening to confessions, for goodness sake. So it was quite an extraordinary job. When my very last week in that job was about the middle of January in 1969 when people who had been burnt in the Lara bushfires were brought in. It was unbelievable. The fire had jumped the Geelong Road and people were caught in their cars and many of them were badly burnt. And some died on the day and others died for quite some time after because of the infections that occurred as a result. But again, that job taught me of how quickly things can change. It taught me about how scared people can be from all sorts of things in their life and rightly so. And these are things that were all in my first jobs. And maybe today as we're thinking of Jesus going to his, yeah, not technically speaking, not his first job, but the beginning of his public ministry, his ministry to people, we might look back on our own experiences and say, well, what were they? What did I learn from them? What was God showing me? And that's what I find when I look back, that God was showing me things in each of those jobs, whether it was the customer was always right in the hierarchy of the workplace, whether it was often the drudgery of a workplace, same thing day after day after day, or whether it was that vulnerability of human need 
and people being scared in any number of different circumstances. These are some of the lessons that I learned, which I found as I moved into my public ministry in 1970, after ordination in 69. These are the things which I know had prepared me for these things. So maybe God sends us messages in the workplace. We don't often think of that. We think of it as just earning a living, and it's that. But it's also messages that we take on board from those around us, from the jobs themselves, the people we meet and work with, and particularly if we have anything to do with the public, that service to which we are all called. And that's what Jesus did. He had learnt in his work at Nazareth as a carpenter, the importance of many people and so on. The fact that he subjected himself to work, W-O-R-K, just like the rest of us, is so precious because it shows that God is with us. We talked about that with Emmanuel over the Advent Christmas time. But he's very much with us within the context of our own work experience. So maybe in union with Jesus, beginning his work in his public ministry, we might think back to those early jobs of our own and say, well, what did God teach me? Maybe he taught us the hard way. Maybe he taught us a soft and gentle way, but certainly there was something there for us to learn from and to take into what our ministry is, whatever it might be, into today and tomorrow. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's now stand and together we'll profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. We come now confidently asking God to hear the prayers of our heart. We pray for the leaders of our church throughout the world and the Archdiocese. May they experience a fresh anointing of the Spirit to be messengers of hope in the current times. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray that all who have been baptised in this church and in our parish may know that the favour of God rests on them. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray that in this year of St Joseph, we may seek his prayers and learn to manage the impact of COVID-19. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have died recently, especially Lawrence Patrick de Alwasa. We also pray for Maliarkal Joseph and all whose memory we keep sacred at this time. May they be welcomed by God to the peace of their eternal home. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. Heavenly Father, we make these prayers to you together with those that are in our hearts and we make them with confidence in the coming of Christ Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. With the mystery of this wine and water, come to share in the divinity of Christ humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. 
fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. God, we ask you to receive us. We please the sacrifice we offer you. Humble and let us pray that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Lord, accept the offerings which we have brought to honour the revealing of your beloved Son. We pray that the offering of your faithful may be transformed into the sacrifice of him who, in compassion, willed to wash away the sins of the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For in the waters of the Jordan you revealed with signs and wonders a new baptism, so that through the voice that came down from heaven we might come to believe in your word dwelling among us, and by the Spirit's descending in the likeness of a dove, we might know that Christ your servant has been anointed with the oil of gladness and sent to bring the good news to the poor. And so with the powers of heaven we worship you constantly on earth and before your majesty, without end, we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and to minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, Peter, our Bishop, all the clergy and all your people. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may be heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, 
in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour are yours for ever and ever. Amen. At the Saviour's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will. You live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other a sign of peace and friendship in Christ. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Well, it's um, wonderful that people are able now, to, at least here in Melbourne and most other places here in Australia, to return to regular attendance at Mass. We know that that's something not to be taken for granted. And many parts of the world people can't gather as we are here in St Simons. And we've been there and done that. Please God, we won't return to that. But throughout this time, the spiritual communion prayer, we say at this time, now online masses has been a tremendously important part of helping not only those who are watching online but also those who are here in the church to focus on the mystery and the value of the Eucharist. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in this most holy sacrament. I love you above all things and that I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, Come spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and I unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord, nourished with the sacred gifts, we humbly entreat your mercy, so that faithfully listening to your only begotten Son, we may be your children, both in name and in truth. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Perhaps we might think especially of people who are, who might be beginning their jobs or returning to work, maybe from home, maybe back into the workplace for the first time for many months in some situations, and maybe within all of that, be very much aware of those who would dearly love to have a job to return to, be it from home or at work. Lots of people still are looking for work, and the job keeper and job seeker areas of support are going to become less into the future. So for those who are looking for work and those businesses struggling to try and keep afloat in order to provide work, our prayers certainly go with all of those associated with that because the whole effort of work, economy and so on is an integral part of our life. We might be very much aware of them during the week to come. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.